Hey everybody, you're watching Adam Neely. I'm your host, question and answer time number 28, answering all of your questions about bass and music in general. So let's get started. Oh, and before we begin, I just wanted to share some music that I've worked on recently. Did some arrangements and production for the New York Nashville video with Justina Maria Soto and her song, The Stars Are All Asleep. New York Nashville Connection is a collective kind of like snarky puppy. So if you enjoy that sort of thing with big lush arrangements with horns and strings, definitely check out this video. Anyway, on to the questions. Carol McNulty writes, For your next vid, show your audience how to compose like Bill Wirtz because I'm dying for someone to fill in while he's taking a break. Oh, sure thing. All you have to do is step one. Create some stuff that sounds good. To you or don't. Inigo Fuster writes, Do most music performance graduates manage to pay the bills slash make a living out of performing? If so, what's the percentage of them who do? Also, which undergraduate and master's degree did you study? I'm considering Berkeley. Thanks. Absolutely not. People coming out of music school will definitely not be able to pay their bills just doing performing. That just doesn't happen. That's not how the whole system's set up. There are too many people out there and too many people competing for the same jobs. It won't happen. And it probably won't happen for at least five or six years out of school where you can say like, all right, performing is just what I do, and that's it, if that even happens. And you know, you might be able to scrape by, but I've heard this, it takes more work being broke than working and having money. Musicians generally are fairly entrepreneurial. They'll teach, they'll figure out odd jobs, they'll figure out ways of making money besides performing, and that's kind of what it is, and that's essentially what I do too. And for the record, I went to Berkeley for my undergraduate degree and Manhattan School of Music for my graduate degree. Vagaravan writes, Hey Adam, do you feel like politics and music are becoming too interesting Intertwined with each other. I'm getting annoyed whenever I see slash hear a musician preaching their political views because it's too repetitive, and most of the time I disagree with their views. I can only seem to listen to bands that don't shove their agenda onto their audience. Musicians should really just play music and entertain. That's really what their job is. Keep your political views private. So no, I definitely disagree with this idea that politics and music should be separate because I think politics, music, and culture are deeply intertwined. And historically, there's a lot of evidence to suggest this. So even if you feel like somebody should just shut up and not spread their political message, you have to understand that musicians have been doing this throughout all of time because music is a product of the culture. Beethoven wrote his Eroica, his third symphony, in dedication to the democratic ideals that he felt Napoleon was espousing, but then he furiously scratched it all out when he learned that Napoleon had declared himself emperor. Messiaen wrote his quartet for the end of time, while interned in a German war camp in, during World War II in 1941. Threnody for the victims of Hiroshima, George Crumb's Black Angels, Jimi Hendrix's Machine Gun, and even Woody Guthrie's This Land is Your Land are all very deeply political. And if you tried to understand those pieces of art and music away from the particular political events that might have surrounded them, you would fail because they're so deeply intertwined. The music is made so much grander. The expression of humanity, the expression of emotion is so much deeper because of the political events and the things that those composers were trying to express. So you don't have to agree with a person's politics because Lord knows I definitely disagree with Wagner's politics, but at the same time you can understand them, and understanding them for what they are is very important. And when you say to somebody, oh, shut up, I don't want to listen to your political views, that represents a fairly simple worldview, and not in a good way, because you're unable or unwilling to come to grips with another person's point of view. Jay Daly writes, Are you really expected to know a bunch of standards in every key when you show up to a jam? It's kind of the impression I'm getting from listening to people talk about jazz, and it's terrifying. So yes, jazz can be fairly intimidating, and that is kind of the barrier of entry, is the jam session. But I would suggest going to whatever session that you're thinking about going to and just seeing what the standards are and seeing like how people interact and seeing if it's a friendly environment, seeing if you could throw your phone up there on the bandstand with your iRealBook Pro just in case you need to like look something up, if that's okay, if that's considered acceptable, because it will vary from session to session. It can be very different depending on where you are and also what sorts of musicians hang out at the jam. So I would say go to jams first, worry about learning everything later after you understand the lay of the land. Joe Miller writes, more of a tech question than musical. The iPad sounds like a great solution. I play piano and mark up the notation for all kinds of things. Is that a problem for the reader you are using? Yes, you can definitely mark up any score that you might have on any sort of app in the iPad. Adobe Reader does it, Fourscore does it. Fourscore has an insane number of options in terms of like being able to put in different notes and all sorts of crazy things and also free draw. You can mark it up any way that you want. Honestly, the iPad is superior to sheet music in every possible way except possibly I've heard 
instances of iPads overheating when you're playing outdoors during the summer, that can suck. And also playing outdoors and having the backlight not be bright enough, that can suck. But for every other application, the iPad is just superior. You can do everything and more than you could with just regular sheet music. Christian Rockman writes, Hey Adam, I'm hoping to attend Berkeley in a couple years, and while I'm no idiot, I'm not exactly an academic. Will taking calculus versus AP calculus matter when it comes to being accepted at Berkeley? Will science or math credits affect their decision? Yeah, so Berkeley is a music school, and music schools only care about what sort of musical ability you have, honestly, in, or in terms of getting it. Maybe your GPA might factor into it a little bit. Do not worry about that. Only take AP calculus if you feel like you are interested in advanced level calculus. Otherwise, I just don't think that's worth your time. I think your time and energy can be better spent doing things you like to do, like hopefully music. Adam Kringle writes, you could test for the existence of a saddest key by playing to subjects recordings of the same piece in different keys and asking which one the subject thinks is the saddest. Then play another piece in several keys and ask the same question. The keys they chose match at a rate more than by chance and there's validity to the idea of a saddest key. This is true even if different people think different keys are the saddest. So this idea gets bandied around occasionally by more scientific types trying to figure out more scientifically which key is the saddest. Well, you're just going to take a recording and play it at different keys and see what sorts of emotional reactions, or they call it in psychology, what sort of valences different people might have to a particular piece of music. But unfortunately, there's a lot of things, a lot of variables which are just not, or just discounted, which are very important. Like I mentioned in that which key is the saddest video, timbre is extremely important. Timbre changes radically depending on the key based upon the physical characteristics of an instrument. So you can sort of account for that by saying like, oh, well, I'm going to digitally alter a particular recording and I'm going to digitally alter it up and down semitones. The problem with that is, is when you digitally alter something, there's a lot of change to the actual timbre of the sound whenever you're moving it up and down. The other thing to take into consideration, this is very important, is keys are relational. So when one person hears one thing in one key, and then they hear that same thing in a key that's maybe a half step higher, they will automatically hear that higher key as being brighter and maybe more exciting than the first key. This is the effect that composers and songwriters have used for hundreds of years to elicit an emotional reaction, like at the big modulation at the end of a power ballad. For example, in like Beyonce's Love on Top with its six modulations or whatever, it gets more and more exciting as the keys get higher and higher. It's not that those keys are intrinsically more exciting, it's just that they're more exciting in comparison to the keys which are a half step lower. So that question, which key is the saddest, can only really be understood in this test that you propose, which key is the saddest in relationship to the first key that you heard? It's a very complicated question that can't be answered that easily. FF2 Lee writes, Sweet video, Adam. Do you plan on doing a lesson on stage press Presence during a performance. If somebody has a good lesson on stage presence, I could really use it because most of the time I end up just sort of staring there looking bored or just sort of flailing around uncomfortably. So uh, yeah, <laughs> maybe somebody can suggest that for me. Brooks Tarkington writes, do you think your YouTube channel has contributed to the success of your wedding band? Do you have clients that are fans of your channel that hire your wedding band and then they're like, you're that bass guy on YouTube? No, uh, the reason why my wedding band is successful has no bearing on this channel. I just do administrative work for them in terms of like organizing music, they do all the booking, uh, the agency does the booking and client relationships and all that stuff. I am just the bass player that occasionally writes horn charts. But I have been recognized once at a wedding and that was cool slash kind of weird, but cool. Shout out to Pete. Sam the Dink Memer writes, what do you think of the musical Hamilton? I am a fan of Lin-Manuel Miranda and Hamilton. And if you're like 99% of my audience, you probably think that musical theater is fairly cheesy, especially if your only experience with musical theater is listening to cast recordings or performing in community theater or in high school. But trust me, it becomes a lot more relevant when you actually see it done at a high professional level. You can kind of understand why cast albums are mixed the way that they are and the way that they sing because it's the best for telling a story. And Lin-Manuel really understands the craft of musical theater in the traditional sense. And also uh, he's really able to bring in more contemporary elements to create a very organic whole. Lucas Cathell writes, Dear Adam, what are the differences between going to a well-known music school like Berkeley, Manhattan School of Music, or Juilliard, and going to a smaller, lesser-known school like maybe California Jazz Conservatory or Cal State East Bay, two local schools close to my hometown? What are the advantages, if any, of going to a bigger school rather than a smaller one? The advantage of going to a big name school like Berkeley or Juilliard comes down to the fact that you are going to be playing with the best musicians in your age bracket of that year. And that 
effect can't really be overstated too much because, man, it, it just will pay dividends for your entire musical career for the rest of your life. The network that you make in college and that sort of like foundation really goes a long, long way, especially if you're going to be living in Boston or New York or any one of the big like music hubs like LA or Nashville. Having that sort of network is very important. I actually had to make that decision when choosing graduate schools. I got accepted to the University of Massachusetts at Amherst and they gave me a full ride plus a stipend to do teaching assistantship. And then I also got accepted to the Manhattan School of Music and they didn't give me any money. And I went to Manhattan School of Music and I think that was one of the better decisions of my life, honestly. Levi Foe writes, Hey Adam, how would you recommend getting involved with a professional band like this? There are a few where I live and I was just wondering what the standard requirements for a gig like this as far as ability goes. I'm a bassist that's beginning a jazz performance degree soon and I'm looking to make a living as a working musician. Your videos have been super insightful and very inspiring. Keep up the great work. Believe it or not, I got my wedding band gig through Craigslist. I saw an ad that they posted. I got invited for an audition. I played a few different styles for them. I charmed them. I explained my experience, blah, blah, blah. And a few weeks later, I said, hey, we want you to play. And then the rest is history. I've been playing with them for about two years now. But honestly, the band has grown a lot since then. And the way that we found other people to play with us and also to find subs for different sorts of things has been through recommendations. People that know members of the band have a much higher chance of getting into the band or getting on the sub list or whatever than people who don't know those people. So I guess the main thing that I'm going to say is you got to meet a lot of people. Meeting people and being on somebody's good side and being part of the general network of people that play these gigs is the way that you kind of find yourself in these situations. I say a lot, but the network goes a long way in order to get work for yourself. So finding more people to play with is always a very, very good thing. Ken Tay writes, Hello, Mr. Neely. Your videos are true infotainment. Intriguing, intelligent, and inspiring, but most importantly bass-centric. So inspiring that I want to use them in the high school literature class I am teaching. Q. Do you have any movie slash vlogging slash video tips to share? Thanks. I mean, it's been said a whole bunch of times, but honestly the best advice to give just is to just do, do it. it. Because on a technical level, what I'm doing is not complicated at all. I'm literally just talking to a camera most of the time. And when I'm vlogging, I'm just setting up my camera in different places. That's it. The music part is the hard part. And that's the thing that I have like all the training and blah, 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 all that stuff. But in terms of communicating this stuff to everybody else, it's not that hard. If you look back at my early channel, like it's just me talking to a webcam. That's really where I just got started. The production value has definitely gone up a little bit, but at the same time, it's at, conceptually, it's the same thing. I certainly didn't go to film school or any of that nonsense just talking to a camera. So if you're interested in doing this stuff, try and just make a habit of it. It might take a while for you to really get into the flow of it, but the nice thing is habits are hard to break. So if you make a habit of doing it, you will get better. So just do it. So just do it! Anthrax N2 Tampax writes, Hey Adam, what is your opinion on earplugs? I use them regularly, but the feeling of disconnection with the music never goes away. Yeah, I do understand that. I would suggest maybe if the music isn't too loud, taking one ear, definitely the ear away from the drummer's cymbals, but one ear out just a little bit, just to give a little bit of like airiness to the room, just so you can feel a little bit more connected to everything. The more that I get older and playing with these bands, like the Metropolitan Players, I'm relying on in-ear monitors for these gigs more and more because I don't want to lose my hearing because wow, is it really loud at the end of four, four hours of this stuff. You really need to protect your hearing. Hugh, <laughs> Hugh Janus writes, <laughs> Did you get pissed off when Pipple clapped before the end? So just so you know, it's proper etiquette to clap at the end of a jazz solo uh, when somebody's improvising. You don't have to do that, but if somebody is clapping at the end of a jazz solo in situations like that, that's what's happening. It's kind of like how it's proper etiquette to not clap at the end of like, movements in a classical piece of work. Like, for example, if there's a space in between the first and second movement, there will always be one person in the co uh, concert hall clapping, and everybody will like kind of death stare and say, shh. Um, I find that really stifling. I find that really, I don't know, unmusical, unemotional, and just kind of stupid. If the, if the spirit moves you to clap, clap. Music is supposed to like tug at the soul and make you do things and experience humanity and experience life. And sitting still when you've had perhaps a very visceral emotional experience uh, can feel... I mean, it defeats the purpose of music. Music is to help us feel emotions, and when you're stifling your emotions while feeling music, it... it, it doesn't jive. So I have a lot of problems with like a lot of classical etiquette, but that's a 
for another Q&A. We'll get to that later. John Roy writes, So your experience as an undergraduate taught you that no one is ever proud of the artwork that they make. This just isn't true. People have all kinds of personalities, and yeah, some expect too much and often disappointed. Your video is useful to those. However, some are the opposite and will only be disheartened by what you say. Maybe you are trying to promote the idea that you are a tormented genius or it's a cry for attention. Man, that certainly was not the purpose of the video, saying that you shouldn't be proud of what it is that you do, things that you've done. It's to be not emotional attached to the object of it. Not being attached to the object does not necessarily mean that you aren't proud of the whole process and the whole thing that went into it. Because I'm sure the monks might take pride in how well that they lay the sand on the mandala. And every time that they make the mandala, it might be that much better and more intricate. And they might be expressing themselves in that moment more and more and more. It's just that they aren't necessarily attached to the end product of it. They aren't seeking their personal validation from that product, like the mandala. It's complete. Instead, they'll take pride, pride and joy in what they do. And it's not saying that somebody who is proud of something is wrong for being proud of it. Or if they aren't feeling the depression after doing something, that they're wrong for not feeling depression. I think you kind of misconstrued this stuff. No, it was not a cry for attention. No, I don't feel depressed after every single thing that I do. I learned my lesson after my recital and I kind of understand the process now. I think a lot of people connected with that particular message and you know, you can just scroll down the comment sections and seeing people explaining uh, for various different types of careers, for architecture, for mathematics, for theater, many different kinds of people related to the message in the video. I'm not saying that you shouldn't take pride in it. I think that's a ridiculous sort of reduction of the whole message of it. And no, it wasn't a cry for attention, but hey, if you wanna click on my video anyway, more power to you. I would encourage you to click on many more of my videos. Dan C writes, is this the recital you spoke about in your latest video, my Berkeley senior recital? It's amazing, man. So actually, no, that's from my graduate recital, which was recorded three years later after my senior recital. By that point, I understood a little bit more about the ups and downs and that whole creative process that way. So even at the end of the graduate recital, I did have like feeling a little bit of depression, but I understood I could come to terms with those emotions a lot more because I just understood it was this constant up and down. It's always gonna be this up and down. But because I was a little bit more on a steady pace, I wasn't as frantic, I didn't invest so much, uh, I guess, like energy into the, thinking about like the glory that my graduate recital might bring, I felt like the end product was a lot better. I felt like I had a lot, just a lot more fun with it too, which is why those videos are up on YouTube. And the videos from my senior recital Aren't. Nadav Ishaki writes, Hey Adam, have you ever pursued the goal of working and performing with some really big pop star, Justin Timberlake, Sia, etc.? What do you think of this kind of job and what would you advise to someone who wants to do this? Man, those gigs are awesome for the musicians involved. They're very difficult to get for that reason. I'm pretty sure you have to live in LA and also spend a lot of time touring with lesser known pop artists before you get to that level. I would love to be able to do like something like that, but honestly, that's just probably not necessarily in my horizon. If it fell on my lap, I would gladly do it because, Lord, that would just be a lot of fun. If you ever look, by the way, at uh, Justin Timberlake's band or Bruno Mars's band, they are incredibly tight. And man, are they having fun. They're digging into that music like anything. And God, that'd be so much fun. Um, someday, maybe in the next life. And that's it. This has been Question and Answer Time with Adam Neely. I hope you enjoyed this week's episode. If you have, please consider commenting, please consider liking, and please consider subscribing. Uh, definitely click the ring button just so you're notified for any sorts of uh, videos that I might be releasing throughout the week. Most of the time, I just release stuff on Monday, but occasionally I have little bonus vlogs and other things coming out throughout the week. So definitely stay tuned for that. If you really enjoy what I do, please consider joining my Patreon um, like these people have done below. Thank you so much for my Patreon supporters because through their support that I'm able to do these videos week after week, uh, it really is humbling that the people were able to uh, in considering doting their hard earned cash for what it is that I do. So thank you so much. I have a couple vlogs coming out uh, relatively soon. I got, I don't know, some cool stuff about rhythm I think is gonna happen next week. We're gonna see exactly which script I decide to shoot, but a rhythmic script is happening next week. So stay tuned for that. And until next time. Peace.